All right. Excellent. Um, welcome, everybody, and to our web users as well. Um, this is the Citrus Distinguished Speaker Series, and my name is Ravi Naman. I'm the Executive Director for Health and Services here at Citrus. Um, as you may know, we typically broadcast this uh, event uh, to all of our sister campuses at Santa Cruz, UC Davis, including their medical center, uh, which happens to be in uh, Sacramento, uh, far from Davis, uh, and UC Merced. So today, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, welcoming Dr. Uh, Don Jones, uh, Qualcomm, who's from Qualcomm. He's the Vice President of uh, Business Development and also runs uh, Health and Life Sciences for them. Um, I've actually had the pleasure of knowing Don from a prior life. Um, I used to work at a health technology think tank, and I'm glad uh, we've actually managed to hook up again. Um, he's responsible for leading Qualcomm's expansion of uh, wireless technologies into consumer health, healthcare, and medical device markets. Uh, prior to uh, joining Qualcomm, uh, Don spent 22 years developing and growing healthcare enterprises. Um, he used to work for American Medical Response. Many of you may know that as the um, um, as the ambulance company, where he was chief operating officer. Um, he worked in Mex uh, for Mexico's largest member-based health service, um, and he was senior vice president of marketing and business for uh, HealthCap, a venture capital-backed startup. Um, and many more. I won't go through it all. Um, Don is also on the board of um, the Alliance uh, Healthcare Foundation, American Telemedicine Association, and is a founding member of the Wireless Life Sciences Alliance. So uh, without any further ado, please welcome Don Jones. Well, good afternoon. We're going to have uh, a time for some questions at the end, so I'll, I've got some slides and then we'll show you some of uh, our thoughts about uh, the use of wireless technologies in, uh, in healthcare. But I uh, definitely want to be able to be available for, uh, for questions. Uh, I've entitled the discussion today about collapsing time and space in healthcare, and uh, really that's the essence of what we think is the opportunity in uh, applying wireless technologies to healthcare. Wireless basically represents connectivity. Connectivity means you can get move information point A to point B. And the efficiencies, the economies uh, that are available in healthcare come from collapsing that time and space that would otherwise be uh, handled in non-connected situations, which is frankly a lot of healthcare, if not most of healthcare, as it's delivered uh, around the world today. So at the end of the day, whether we're talking about therapy management or monitoring, or um, um, it's any kind of, uh, kind of remote diagnostics, the, uh, the theme uh, ultimately in terms of where the ROI lies is being able to make things happen faster than they would otherwise happen in an unconnected world and as a result intervene on the therapy, intervene on the intervention um, and or um, make the processes work, uh, work faster. So, why is Qualcomm, why is a, a, a chip designer, a mobile um, a leader in mobile device uh, a wireless technology even in this space? Well, we're at the point in, uh, in our industry where the speed and connectivity and the processing power of the devices is, reach, is reaching the point that they can do uh, an awful lot. It's uh, kind of not unlike uh, what's happened uh, with the uh, laptop and PC marketplace where we went from a phase when we were all concerned about the fa how fast our chip was to today where most people don't even know what the speeds of the chips are in their devices. We're seeing that uh, come up in the, in the wireless space. And, uh, and so we're beginning to move and shift our focus into what you can do from a services and application space. So when we look at our industry, we, you know, we look at it as first we integ integrated horizontally with the, uh, the, the folks that made devices. We added uh, uh, the s software layers. We worked with content providers, uh, moved out to the internet itself, and, and now, in the case of uh, healthcare and life sciences, we're, um, we're starting to look at how do we integrate in with the services and functions that are available within the, uh, the healthcare field. So it's, you can, the, the notion or, or message here is that mobile connectivity uh, and including healthcare in it is just a natural progression of uh, what's been going on in the, in the industry overall. Many of you are familiar with uh, the Kindle from Amazon. This is the version one. There's version two is just popping out. I'm going to come back to why we think this is a very important model in healthcare, but I will just draw your attention to, um, to a couple of things about the about the device. What the Kindle allows you to do is, when you finish the content you're you're reading or perusing on your Kindle device, and you want more content essentially more content is one button away. 
you essentially have a very simple process of making a digital request and getting digital fulfillment of what you want without, for example, getting out of your beach chair. And um, that concept has an interesting uh, applications within healthcare, which we'll come back to. Another thing that's interesting is essentially multimodal communications. Gobi happens to be one of our chips in this area, but this is, and this is representative of essentially all the wireless technologies currently deployed around the world um, for the, with only one or two minor, relatively minor exceptions right now, all on one ship. But really the important concept here is the ability to have modems that have all the wireless connectivity so that no matter how you, want, how you might connect, you are connected. So whether it's Wi-Fi or it's CDMA or WCDMA, whether it's 3G or 2.5G or 2G forms of connections, you're, you as a user aren't concerned about how you're connecting. You just know that you have the confidence of being able to connect. This is becoming a very interesting uh, uh, form of deploying technology for medical device companies. He here's typically what happens to a medical device company that historically has used uh, connectivity. If they deployed a device in the home, more often than not they use POTSLINE or plain old telephone service landline connections. What's happening now today is they can't count on a landline being available. So the next question is, is well, what do I do? I either have to go install a landline Pay, arrange to pay for those services, or you might think the next logical thing to do would be to rely on the broadband that's in the home or the Wi-Fi that's in the home. But here's the problem, and, and it becomes very illustrative when you look at the history with the POTS line. For those devices that were deployed in the home that all that was required of the consumer was to plug it into the wall in the phone jack, 40% of the time they never got plugged in. The consumer wasn't willing to take on that extra step. And so now when you go for one step further and say, well, let's connect it to the broadband or to the Wi-Fi, and you've got to do the pairing, and you've got to repair the brakes, the wireless brakes when they occur, it just doesn't, it's not going to happen on a reliable enough basis enough, enough times, which means you have to have a service truck and a service technician, and somebody else has to go set that all up. So not only may you not even have the connectivity, you, uh, you have to have all these services costs. So what we're beginning to see is a desire, whether we're talking about mobile devices or fixed devices that are going to sit on countertops or bed stands, uh, a desire to have them be able to drop ship into people's homes and be able to be remotely managed, remotely diagnosed, and, um, and ensure that they're actually connected and working without any technician or service person ever touching the device. And then uh, we're starting to see in the mobile device world very high uh, fast processors becoming available. So you'll start to see one gig and one and a half gig uh, uh, processors available in mobile devices. They'll start off in these kind of uh, uh, mobile internet computing devices or um, netbook kind of, kind of devices. But the same processors are going to go into lots of other kinds of devices. Essentially anything that you can imag imagine that would have a, an advantage of being connected has an opportunity to be built around a cell phone chip for both its processing capabilities as well as its communications capabilities. So what are we doing in wireless health and where do we see the opportunities in wireless health? Well, two weeks ago on February 11th, we passed the four billion subscribers in the world using cell phones. So roughly two thirds of the world's population now has a cell phone. For most of the world's population, from our perspective, it's, it's the only computer people are gonna own. And, and so the opportunity is, it is their point of connection, it is their point of processing power, and uh, the opportunity obviously to apply it to healthcare is, um, is where we think there's a great opportunity to get a very, very important ROI, whether it be measured financially or in better outcomes uh, from a healthcare perspective, to combine that, those capabilities with, uh, with healthcare needs. Now does that mean all healthcare needs have to use cellular? No. There's lots of wireless technology. Cellular happens to represent a good backhaul capability some, uh, some of the times. But at the end of the day, we're also focused on body area networks, local area networks, as well as the wide area networks. And, and, um, and these can include, obviously, uh, things like 802.11 technologies and, uh, and uh, some of the future 4G and probably eventually 5G kinds of technologies. So this, this is a map of uh, the way we view the world and how we've organized our activities in the world in healthcare. Across the top in the white are things we're doing to help build the ecosystem in healthcare, meaning activities to get engage the medical device companies, the wireless, um, the wireless companies, the health services companies, pharmaceutical companies, 
and get them all in one place. We founded the Wireless Life Science Alliance um, about four and a half years ago. We bring about 200 CEOs of life science companies together into La Jolla at an event hosted by the CEO of Qualcomm and the Chief Scientific Officer of Johnson & Johnson and focus entirely on business models. And this is perhaps one of the key lessons here. It's more often than not, the technology is not the hurdle to deploying wireless and connectivity in healthcare. It's the business model that's the biggest hurdle. What's going to actually work from a use case scenario and from a, from a payment scenario? How can you build a business around the technology that you've, you've envisioned? And that's really what the wireless life science is focused on. We happen to hold an investors conference as well as part of that. We think this area is so important, we're working on a wireless medicine, medicine institute that will combine clinical research with, um, with the engineering work and actually deploy wireless technologies for clinical trial purposes uh, into the industry, work, on, uh, work with wireless sensor uh, companies, and actually validate um, a various solutions. So you'll, you'll see some future announcements about, um, about a wireless health institute. Uh, it's meant to actually integrate with other universities, so you'll see an opportunity to, to uh, affiliate with it and uh, participate in it uh, uh, coming, coming down the road. Continue is very important. Continue Health Alliance was, was uh, began uh, about three years ago by Intel, uh, but it's become a very important way of connecting between companies working in the wireless uh, health space. There's about 200 companies in it. It's made up of health service providers like Kaiser, wireless carriers like Sprint, OEMs like LG and Samsung and Motorola, and, it's, um, uh, and, and, it, and, it, essentially, and it has uh, pharmaceutical companies like Roche and Pfizer as well. So it's really an interesting cross-section of companies, meets all, all around the world, and it's working on standards, interoperability standards for consumer health applications and beginning to actually have some impact on how companies are designing their products and uh, a certification process. The, the large um, foundations in the world are starting to pay attention here and are, have actually formed something called the M-Health Alliance. And that's important because they want to deploy technology that can scale across developing countries in an inexpensive way to actually solve healthcare problems. And you can see the United, Health, United Nations Foundation and the Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation have actually all teamed up here. So this is really ultimately a financing mechanism for deployment of, uh, of mobile technologies around the world. And then we have a, an effort around in integrating uh, wireless technologies with various sensors so that um, the sensor guys can actually get their stuff wirelessly enabled and, um, and tested in the clinical environment as quickly as possible because a lot of times the sensor guys aren't necessarily wireless guys and vice versa. In our investment as a company, we invest in new technologies that have implications in, um, in healthcare. Low power radios, ultra low power radios are certainly one area that's very important for body area networks. Uh, we invest in co new companies in the life sciences area. There's a couple examples there. I'll talk a little bit more about them. Triage is in what's called the, what we call the smart band-aid business. So uh, biosensors plus batteries plus radios plus, plus processors and peel and stick disposables. I will say we're, we're particularly bullish on the Band-Aid industry is likely to be very successful. We think the market size there is very large and we think the initial markets, which are likely to be hospital-based, are particularly fruitful. The research suggests that disposable Band-Aids that will likely last between 30 minutes for an application to say three days are likely to sell wholesale out between $15 and $30 a piece. Um, for the developed world Band-Aid space, and we think the market size is measured in hundreds of millions, eventually billions of units. Um, it's particularly interesting when you look at uh, monitoring vital signs in hospitals, especially not in the ICU beds, which is where people have been used to having monitored, but in all of the other beds. We're going to be facing a worldwide shortage of nursing. Nurses manually take vital signs, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure. It takes a lot of time. They have to go room for room. Band-Aids take care of this automatically. And then they become part of data systems. Those data systems can have predictive modeling attached to them. And it can free up some of this manual labor so the nurses can actually do things that have more clinical impact uh, directly. And then Wireless Reach is an interesting uh, a program we have that actually funds uh, it's a grant, it funds grants of one to two years up to a quarter million dollars and these are demonstration projects using wireless technologies and we're getting a lot of different proposals. There's about, there's about 40 projects around the world 
Many of them are in healthcare. And they, apply, and they range from teledermatology projects using cell phones for dermatology to uh, traditional video teleconferencing applications um, in medicine to um, a actually we have a hospital system in Africa that where the entire hospital's uh, IT infrastructure is run off the cell phone system because there is no copper. So the, there are no wires in the building, for, frankly, other than power. So the, uh, er, the entire hospital runs, on, runs wirelessly. Um, we found a need in the market that uh, we decided to take on. And that need was is that the US carriers in North America are not particularly aggressively willing to jump into supporting healthcare and the medical space. So we started a company called Lifecom to become essentially a wireless carrier that was savvy and understood the life sciences space. And meaning it knew the issues and it addressed those, addressed those issues. Um, we did this because the carriers are afraid of liability and they're afraid of you know, how to approach the market and develop the market. I, I, I make an example that it's akin to 1999 when RIM was knocking on people's doors and saying there's a market for email mobile email, and the carriers basically said, eh, we don't think so. And then RIM had to kind of start, had to come up with their own hardware, their own software, their server software, and even a service of getting servers behind the firewalls at the Fortune 500 in order to prove the marketplace. And today, you can get, obviously, your BlackBerry from a Verizon or Sprint or an AT&T. But at the beginning, you couldn't. You had to go to RIM. So we're trying to do, we're, we believe there's a similar kind of market here in, in the area of health phones. Uh, and we believe you know, this is one way where we'll help set an example to help the, the health services folks, the medical device folks, the wireless carriers, and the OEMs recognize that, uh, that wireless technologies can be deployed for consumer uses in health. The, the next three companies here, CardioNet, CardioMEMS, and Triage, all happen to use a, a data management and remote device management platform we have. But they're, they're good examples of, of folks that are commercial doing things in the uh, in the healthcare space. CardioNet is actually now a public company. Uh, it does remote electrocardiogram monitoring. It's had almost 200,000 patients on it. It's really kind of the granddaddy of wireless health uh, from my perspective. It's almost six years old in terms of deployment. It's had great clinical trials. The clinical trials show that it's 300% more clinically effective than the old gold standard. You don't see that in healthcare. You don't see things make that kind of jump. This, this one did uh, in, in general. And, um, and they've obviously been through lots of, lots of patients. It's essentially cardiac telemetry like you'd have in a hospital, but done you know, while you're driving out on the freeway at 70 miles an hour with diagnostics in the background and information sharing to, uh, to healthcare providers. CardioMEMS is a MEMS-based sensor that's actually sewn into the heart, hit by a radio wave from a pillow transmitter, and then uh, managed to a back-end system for managing uh, congestive heart failure patients about 5,000 patients in a clinical trial now on the CardioMEMS platform. The key here is, is to, to manage therapeutics, and in this case, a diuretic. So the biology here is that as fluids build up around the heart, the heart becomes less efficient. Um, the patients start getting, going into distress, and if they get bad enough, they end up being admitted to the hospital. The typical late-stage CHF patients get admitted in excess of two times a year at somewhere in the neighborhood of $60,000 per admission all for the lack of basically a drug that costs pennies that would, co that would allow them to essentially urinate off the excess fluid if they had more diuretic in their system. So this is really a pill sensor. It's saying, take more of this drug on a real-time basis. There are lots of different efforts to try and, try and do this, but it's an example where sensors can be used to manage therapy in a way that can avoid uh, an awful lot of costs and consequences and, and, and ultimately even death for, for the patient. And then triage, again, is in that wireless space. Um, they've gone for seven vital signs. Their, their claim to fame and, and what makes them a very interesting company is measuring blood pressure without a cuff. That's a bit of a holy grail. Um, they're doing it as an imputed, um, algorithmic-driven uh, blood pressure off three other sensors, sensor technology. They are using wireless in the body area network, so they're using smart band-aid technology where around the body the, the devices are communicating. They're communicating to a screen-based uh, monitor that can be essentially Velcro to grandma's bed. And then that monitor also is cellular-based, so it can actually be part of a network-based system. So you can see local monitoring as well as regional and, and uh, network-based monitoring. And then eventually you can see the opportunity to put predictive modeling into effect there and take and do diagnostics 
do uh, do ther therapeutic interventions, uh, just monitor for health, etc. Diagnostics as a service is an area where we believe holds a lot of opportunity. We've seen some examples here at Berkeley that are pursuing down this road, and, and I think there's, there's plenty of other examples around. The idea of actually moving from a model where we sell a box that makes a diagnosis and reduce it down to something much simpler in the form of sensors, combinations of sensors, et cetera, move a lot of the smarts to the, to the, to the network, to the cloud, and manage the interaction of what happens with the diagnostics is really what we think of as diagnostics as a service, what, what that really means. Uh, and the example I like to use just to kind of paint a picture from a box is, is you can look at an ECG machine that a doctor might buy for his office. 10,000 to 30,000, depending on the, on the model and features for a 12-lead uh, uh, ECG machine. You can reduce all of the leads to a wireless signal for sub $100. Put all the other processing in the, cl in the clouds, return the results back. It completely radically changes the cost of the diagnostics. In the developed world, it means essentially you can have a 12 lead ECG, ECG, ECG machine in, in a lab coat pocket, in every exam room. Doctor, doctors don't have to share them around the offices. In the developing world, it means you have a machine you never had um, at, a, at a completely different point. So it's all about capital expenditure costs and shifting, you know, how. how uh, how monies are used and invested in order uh, even having diagnostics. But that's just one example. There are hundreds and hundreds of examples of, of how diagnostics can be delivered as a service instead of as a, as a box kind of sale. And then the newest area we're working on is something we've labeled personal supply chain management. This is a very simple concept and goes back to the, what I pointed out about Kindle. If you remember Kindle, you finish the book, you don't get out of the beach chair, you just push a button, you get your next book and go on and read. You got the content. So if you apply that same concept in medical, to, to medical products that are the same product over and over again, pills, diabetic test strips, uh, and the list goes on and on. If you could present to the consumer the ability to say, I want some more, at the point in time when they, need, they know they need some more, uh, you can dramatically change the supply chain. So in the, in the picture here, it says, imagine if the easy button was kind of on the lid of the empty pill bottle right as you're pouring those last couple of pills out and just push the button and UPS or FedEx resupplied you the next day. That's kind of the, the paradigm here we're, we're addressing. And why does that make sense? Well, a lot of these things have actually very high margins in them today. So there's, there's money in, the, in kind of the network to kind of cover this. But let me go back to the Kindle model to give you the illustration. What has Kindle done for Amazon in terms of the distribution process? It's disaggregated paper, the printing press, binding, photographs, cardboard, trucks, and Barnes and Noble stores out of distribution. Now this doesn't, doesn't do all of that here because obviously in the Kindle model you're getting the content distributed digitally, but you can get a lot of it out and you can make it a lot more convenient. We think this is a way in healthcare to actually get an ROI immediately to a medical device company or a pharmaceutical company for adopting wireless while they're spending years to figure out outcomes, clinical efficacy of solutions. So in other words, they can have a reason for investing in the wireless infrastructure in a product, get a return on investment immediately because they're actually selling more product. They're creating a system around their product and fulfillment. They're taking costs out of distribution. And over, and over time, they can collect the data to prove the, uh, the clinical efficacies that they're, they're after to show that their systems actually work better. So this is an example of the areas. We've kind of touched on these areas, um, ranging from Band-Aids to smart pills to, um, to, uh, to body-worn sensors. Um, some of you probably are some, somewhat familiar. The slide on the left is Medtronic slide showing commercially available wireless implants. So sensors in the body with wireless connectivity. Sensors that are in clinical trials or development with wireless that are implants inside of the body. These are what we've categorized as all the areas that Band-Aids are in development on right now today and what the use cases are. So diagnostic, occupational, urgent care, et cetera and the kinds of things they plan to measure. So this is, a, this is a collection of many, many, many companies that are working in the Band-Aid space in terms of what they intend to do with the Band-Aids. These are all companies we've, we've met with and, and worked with in one way or another. But you can see it's quite varied. 
Um, some, of the, some of the things are quite simple, things like simple things like heart rate. Other things are much more complex, like edema. Measure, and uh, um, one, one of the more interesting ones, I think, in terms of, um, of both the application of a technology and achieving potentially achieving a holy grail is measuring caloric intake. Not burn, but intake. And in this case, it's one of the uh, technologies built around edema. So they're imputing uh, caloric intake based on the changes in fluid retention in the body through a Band-Aid technology. Very interesting, very, very large market. If you can get a use case down to a Band-Aid, essentially a peel and stick gas gauge that says you've got 300 more calories available to consume today. Do you want the milkshake or, or, <laughs> or the salad? So um, kind of interesting following these. I'm going to run down through a few of the examples of, of companies that, uh, that we work with to give you some examples of the variety. We've, we've talked about cardio MEMS. There's a little picture of the little MEMS-based sensor next to a dime. So you can see, obviously, it's very, very small. I said it, there's no wired, it's not wireless itself. It's, it, um, it's hit by, uh, by RF that's in a transceiver in the, in the pillow. Um, Cardio net, here's the setup, very simple. You can begin to see this is, this is how you can do an ECG and move it all into the clouds. This, is, this is essentially functions as the gateway. This happens, in their device case, happens to collect more information from the consumer through a touch screen. Um, but, but arguably, in this kind of setup, you can imagine that the cell phone might, e might even be eventually someday actually worn here. Or you could actually see the wireless uh, uh, connectivity actually just occurring at the electrodes themselves. And you know, we're certainly seeing activity moving in that direction. The fitness area is very, very important in this space. Arguably today, the two most successful companies in wireless health are Nintendo and Nike. Both have well over a million customers using wireless technologies. Um, the models are well accepted. They put, they've built in social networking. They've built in the factor of fun. Uh, and they've built in price points that obviously make sense for folks. So, um, we, you know, we think we'll see a lot, a lot more. But you can imagine that, for example, the chest strap for runners that you see, like Polar, for use, will easily be able to be reduced to something as simple as a Band-Aid. So now you have a, something that's disposable. Why is that important? Well, the folks that tend to wear the chest strap tend to be the, kind of the, the buffed out guys. It's not comfortable for women, and a lot of people don't want to advertise that they're concerned in measuring it by wearing that unless they're already in good shape. So the Band-Aid takes away, potentially takes away some of those factors. The home health hub business, we talked a little bit about getting those into the home. This happens to be a Japanese company that, that uh, we're familiar with that interacts with these kinds of medical devices over here on the right. What makes Japan really an interesting place for home hubs and for coaching and disease management is that in 2008, the government of Japan mandated metabolic exams for everybody that turned age 40 and older. And you're, you're now measured at work, literally measured and weighed at work, and if you fail according to the charts, your company pays a fine and the contribution to the health trust go up. So this is mandated. Some of you might have seen it on CNN as people were lining up. It's a three-year implementation process, but they're kind of, they've gone all, all the way to f essentially federally mandated um, dis disease management with interventions and fiscal penalties. So we're starting to see that's a marketplace that's saying, OK, well, there's, we can see value immediately because we're writing checks. Uh, to actually intervene for our employees that are cost, now costing us more money. This, this illustrates triage's uh, uh, process. You can see right now uh, these are just engineering prototypes on the arm, arm-based uh, worn sensors here on the patient's arm, the little uh, monitor, which is both a local area and wide area monitor, and then uh, kind of the progress down in the smaller Band-Aid size uh, uh, you know, sensors that will be part of, uh, part of their system. Drug delivery is another really interesting area that we've, we've seen quite a bit of activity. Um, essentially, the idea that you can wirelessly control and, and uh, as well as obtain uh, uh, various sensor data from a drug delivery patch system. So this would be a reservoir that holds a drug that you peel and stick and slap on. You can think of it as a Band-Aid, but controllable. A classic example where this could be used would be morphine delivery, where you can actually change the morphine amount over time wirelessly controlled, as well as pick up something as important as heart rate and respiratory rate while the patient's being monitored. So you're now actually changing drug supply while you actually have a monitoring, monitored kind of situation going on. Microchips has a different, uh, 
approach to the same concept. This one's a subcutaneous implant. So this is a drug, a radio controlled drug delivery system that actually goes under the skin and uses a radio signal to, to break a, uh, a fuse link on a reservoir that contains a drug. So you make a, an electromechanical break on a reservoir, allow a drug that's been freeze dried in the, um, in the well to then uh, be pulled out through the interstitial fluid into the body. Um, it can actually hold, um, depending on which drug you're having, they're kind of targeting about a year's worth of drug supply. So this would be implanted in the body, wirelessly controlled, has other sensors, and can be triggered uh, remotely to release, release a, a drug. And then an area that we're seeing a lot of uh, emphasis, and we've seen some good examples here at Berkeley, how to bring healthcare delivery to lo more lower trained people in more remote villages in developing countries and connect them back to the more sophisticated medical care centers uh, in the larger cities. And certainly India, China, and, and Africa are full of opportunities in, in, uh, in that area. This area that uh, is illustrated by a company called Proteus Biomedical, which is a Bay Area company, is really interesting because it represents a huge push by the pharmaceutical industry. This particular company is actually developing radios and processors in pills. So these are little tiny, tiny uh, uh, radios that when you swallow them, your stomach acid forms the battery acid that powers the little impulse radio for seven to 10 minutes. It's then read on a Band-Aid, and i so, sorry, I don't have a picture of the Band-Aid, but you wear a, wear a radio receiver in the form of a Band-Aid on your abdomen. That picks up the, now, that, now this, this pill now has an electronic serial number, which has an interesting added benefit of actually addressing some of the problems we have uh, with counterfeiting. So you get the serial number of that pill, the patient, and, you, and the confirmation fact that that patient actually took that pill. They're working on actually according some sensors in here. They think they've got heart rate and pH right now also being able to be captured and transmitted. So where is this interesting? Well, it's interesting initially for compliance purposes. T tuberculosis drugs is one of the areas that's uh, interesting. Is the patient taking their drug? Um, and there's actually a clinical trial going on right now in, for, t for exactly that purpose. But more interesting what the pharmaceutical industry is interested in is they're, th they're saying to themselves, Listen, we're spending a billion dollars to develop an each new compound. By the time we get the compound in the marketplace, we've got four or five years left on our patent run. And then it's over. Then the generics come in and wipe us out. So how can we make a system out of our compound? How can we use kind of a systems engineering approach and, and make our compound, the drug, actually just one component of the system so that even when the patent goes out on the, on the molecule, it's important from a physician's perspective and from a patient's perspective that they, they still get our drug because it's part of a, of a complete uh, feedback loop system. So this just represents one of the efforts in that area where we've actually seen numerous efforts where the pharmaceutical industry overall wants to figure out how to systemize the pharmaceutical agent in order to basically obtain longer patent life uh, for their products mentioned earlier the, you know, the idea of the personal supply chain management. This just illustrates that idea around kind of the inhaler. You need, you need more drugs. So whether that, that might be on the peak flow meter as illustrated by the girl or actually on the inhaler itself, these are examples of product that the patient needs over and over again, same product over and over again. Um, they know when they need it because they're getting near the end of whatever supply they have. And there's an opportunity to take advantage of the supply chain management to, to make a business case for putting the wireless connectivity in the device while the clinical case can be built over a period of time. And uh, our, our LifeCom solutions, uh, one of the areas that, that uh, we think there's a lot of opportunity in that we're working on is in diabetes, uh, diabetes management uh, and, and illustrates the fact that when you provide health care on a phone or on a mobile device, it's not just providing access to information. It's not just providing a test. It usually ha involves kind of some kind of systematic approach that may involve advice, either digital advice, may involve live people, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's part of a, an elaborate system. And again, I go back to the rim analogy with uh, Blackberries on how there was a system evolved. It took, mobile email really did not take off until we actually optimized the hardware, optimized the software, optimized the servers, and optimized the 
the interconnection behind the, uh, the business um, firewalls uh, at the Fortune 500 before everything worked together and people saw the value in, in, uh, in mobile email. This, app, this is an example of an application that's actually commercial, so commercial on Verizon, Sprint, and AT&T now. Uh, it, it, but it's also illustrative of, of problems that, and challenges we have getting healthcare applications onto uh, major carriers. Um, it took, it took uh, 18 months to get an application, which is essentially a digital form of a book that's been on sale in bookstores for the last 20 years called The Pill Book, which is a random house publication. It's basically the consumer version of the Physician Desk Reference Series. In this one, they added an alarm clock so you can set up reminders, and they, uh, they added the opportunity to share that you've confirmed that you've taken your pills with a second party, so you can monitor kind of how grandma's doing or how your kid's doing. Have they confirmed they've taken their pills? But it also allows you to do drug-to-drug -drug interactions and manage your medication list. So it took a long time, but it's here today. And, and interestingly enough, it's a starting point. One of the interesting starting points behind this is the ability to query patients. So there's a whole survey tool b built in here. We're starting to see uh, used for surveillance purposes. So I, 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 you, I point to this just because it's a simple example. It's actually commercial in the marketplace. It's something people can point to and potentially use today. It has a payment model, which I don't think in the long run is going to be the one that makes the most sense. It's a consumer pay model right now. It's $3.99 a month. I think at the long run, it's going to be the healthcare payer or the retail pharmacy or the pharmaceutical company that's going to want to pay for these kinds of applications because they'll increase compliance and presumably increase consumption uh, of the product. But in the meantime, this is something that you can download on any number of phones, uh, phones today. And Three dollars and ninety-nine cents. Yes, <laughs> yeah, three three ninety-nine. It's like a it's like a consumer game application on you know on your iPhone or or something. So, I talked a little bit about the fitness area. F fitness is uh, going to be a very very large area. It could be a large area before healthcare. The challenge we have in the fitness area is is that the you, know, you go back to the heart rate sensor concept. The heart rate sensor that will be sold to the hospital for fifteen dollars a band aid is likely to be the same sensor that's in the Nike. Nike Band-Aid in the future, but which market is going to, are they going to go after first? Uh, obviously the $15 one, because eventually Nike's not going to sell you heart rate Band-Aids until they can sell you, you know, a dozen for $19.95 or something, something along that lines. So it'll take a while for the volumes to get up high enough where, where that will make sense, but the hospital market looks like it can drive, it can drive those markets uh, fast enough. Mica is a really interesting company. Um, what Mica has has taken on as a challenge is how to take new forms of multimedia communication, integrate them into physician and healthcare provider workflow. So they've said, instant messaging, text messaging, video chat are all new forms of communication that are coming, but they won't be adopted by healthcare professionals unless they can transact on those. They can get paid for them. They can record them. They can be fully integrated in electronic medical record systems. They can share them, et cetera. So they've built an electronic medical record platform and practice management system that actually integrates all of those uh, systems in. Um, and, and they did that not only because you can obviously video chat on, on PCs, but you're going to be able to do that on mobile internet devices. And in some countries around the world, and eventually in the United States, we'll, have a, uh, uh, we'll be able to do that on our cell phones as well today. Uh, companies based in Canada, they already have video conferencing cell phones deployed in Canada, so they're actually using them in, 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 uh, in, in Canada. Um, interesting company, though, uh, and an interesting challenge. So they invented this really interesting piece of technology. Um, the consumer interface to this technology looks like an Apple-designed electronic medical rep record system. Very, very consumer friendly. It's one I think we, you'd all look at and say, well, I could actually interact with this. This, this would be really nice. Then the question is, how do they sell it? And in the in the product, because it's a pretty radical product. Um, so what they what they've done as a company is they went out and launched their own practice to create a lab. And in do, launching their own practice, they had to launch a practice in an environment that doesn't, for the most part, pay for virtual consultations. So how do you launch a medical practice that doesn't have a reimbursement mechanism? So they went to they picked New York City, particularly. Because New York City has a very high percentage in the United States of consumer pay for primary care, cash pay, much higher than any other place in the United States. And there's lots of reasons for it, it's just, but it's just, it's just a fact. So they launched a practice model 
um, around a, a brand they're build, building called Hello Health. And Hello Health is a little bit like Starbucks meets Apple Store as a primary care practice site. Doesn't look like any primary care practice you've ever seen. The business model is a little bit along the lines of come on in, meet your doctor, and don't come back because we're going to handle as much as we can virtually as possible. Their target market is kind of 18 to 40 year old Mac users because they're I they got iChat on their machines. They're ready to go, so to speak. And they literally advertise in the subway systems and on buses and very, very different kind of medical practice. In order to solve the um, financial model, they have a $35 a month membership fee. But interestingly enough, they stock generic drugs. And so within your $35, you get all the drugs you can eat for the ones they stock uh, for your $35 a month. And the physicians will talk to you and interact with you as much as you want virtually. From a pricing perspective, and this is where the economics gets interested, they threw out the CPT code book and said, we have three visit rates, 100, 150, and $200. They arranged on time. We don't care about the codes. Depending on how much time you take, you either owe us 100, 150, or $200. It's that simple. So it's transparent. It's the McDonald's kind of menu board kind of system. So they're using this to kind of test the platform. In the meantime, a number of entities, big IDNs, are starting to look at them. And actually, two have actually licensed their, their platform here recently to actually deploy into nurse staff call centers, in two cases, physician staff call centers, um, and in one case that I know of, uh, beginning to actually build their own primary care model uh, using the ability to kind of virtually interact with folks. So I think we're going to see more virtual interaction. It's going to happen. It already is available, you know, obviously, in, in many ways. But the key to the business model here is not the technology. It's the underlying business model. Who's going to pay? How are they going to pay for it? Are you going to pay, get paid for the virtual interactions? Or do you physically have to be in the office? Kaiser has done a lot of research. Over 50% of primary care, according to Kaiser's research, can be done virtually. You don't need to be in the office. Even for surgical consults, the follow-up visits, Many of them can be done virtually. A lot of times they're just looking for signs of infection, that sort of thing, on the incision and that sort of thing. So there's often a lot of possibility to do some, not all, of the, uh, of the visits virtually. There's a lot of challenge in this area. This is a list of challenges as we see them, where a company like Qualcomm can play. There are, these are not all of the challenges. There's certainly challenges around, um, uh, around uh, encryption and encryption systems um, that, that can, uh, can play in here to address privacy and confidentiality. We tend to focus more along kind of the radio challenges and topography, topology of the radio systems is kind of our key focus. But at the end of the day, these are some of the key challenges that we think have to be solved for, for, uh, for some of the sensor networks to be scalable um, you know, around, the, around the world. And at the end of the day, we're, we're doing that so we can enable this kind of vision uh, to uh, come into the marketplace. This also illustrates our role as a, as a company and I think the role of our industry and the wireless industry in here is we're not life science people. We're wireless people that are enabling another industry. And so our, mo our business model is partnering. We, we work with medical device companies, with health services companies. It's a partner model. Nothing in the telecommunications world happens by one company. They're, it's, it's collections of companies, kind of like building an airplane. No one company builds airplanes. They're collections of many, many, many companies. We think that's true in this, in this area, too. So it very much requires a partnering model to actually take a product, an invention, and put it into a service and or system that ultimately has value to either the physician or the patient or the healthcare system uh, or the consumer. So we think this is a huge opportunity. We think uh, consumers are not afraid of uh, telehealth. We think some, some of the healthcare professionals are afraid of it. Uh, sometimes for reasons of not understanding it or because it's dis there may be disaggregation of revenue streams and income in some of the solutions. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the uh, research says consumers are not afraid of it. They're probably ahead of the traditional health care providers and, and willing to, to, move, uh, to move in this direction. So I co coined uh, the topic here and what we're working on is placing everybody on the net <laughs> and uh, as, as something we're trying to help enable. and. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity and be invited here and sharing our thoughts of how, how wireless can be applied to collapse time and space in, in healthcare and how some of the companies and examples are beginning to extract uh, value and, and positive uh, outcomes out of, the, uh, out of the equation. So happy to take questions.
We have time for a few questions. Uh, please wait for the microphone to come to you. Any takers? Must be I asked. answered all your questions. <laughs> Question over here. I mean, there's so few people you can probably just hear, right? Yeah. I mean, I, actually, saying I, I, oh. so anyway, I have a question for you for later. But right now, just the, one of the problems with some of this is that the, the protocols are going to change, right? So the Kindle's out there with whatever it has for wireless. And in a couple of years, people are going to be unhappy because their $399 Kindle or whatever no longer connects because we're no longer on that standard. So. What's the, what's the product lifetime that's expected for a lot of this stuff with the different wireless protocols? Yeah, so the question is, what's the product lifetime? And that's a great question because the, it's a complicated answer. And it's a complicated answer partly because the expected life of consumer devices and, and the expected life of medical medical devices are kind of two different ends of the spectrum. So often medical devices are designed and expected to have a 10 to 15 year life, whereas the consumer devices may be kind of more in tune with three to five years maximum, really hoping that people turn them over in, say, two years. Um, and on top of that, we've got radio technologies being developed that, that where, where chips are being run, and then they come to a very end, end of life very, very quickly before a next model comes along. So a medical device company has a hard time saying to themselves, I'm going to build around a cellular chip, uh, knowing that I'm going to build a product for the next ten, the same product for the next ten years, no, and knowing that the cell chip won't be there, the one they pick today won't be there tomorrow. So the way many of them are addressing that is to separate separate the communications kind of module from the medical device. So they're creating designs where there there's kind of a plug-in for the communications module. So you still get a, a, a nice package box where the communications model module is kind of hidden, but it's essentially a removable. Uh, model they, where they can update it to keep track uh, to keep up with the technology. Now, the reality in the cellular industry is that we we typically incorporate all the old technologies and make things backwards compatible for a period of time. And that period of time looks like it probably you know, we haven't been doing it that long, but it looks like it's probably 15 to 20 years before the bottom technology, the oldest technology, kind of falls off. It's kind of like the IR port or the you know falling off your 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 PC and um, and you know the app, the new Apple um, Air doesn't even have an Ethernet port. You know, so we, we kind of have the same thing going on with, with the wireless technologies. But they tend to have, actually have, looking backwards, a pretty pretty decent life. It's looking forwards where the manufacturers are saying, how do, how do I pick a technology to build on, knowing I'm going to build the same device for 10 years? And that's where they come into a little bit of problems. So the solution seems to be just to split the communications out from the core medical device. That also solves the some of the FDA and CE. Uh, rec uh, prop challenges in terms of certifying the device. So th this is really interesting uh, um, scenario as you present with respect to delivering care and um, inducing people to get care. So um, there are about five questions here. Let's just d do two. Suppose, <laughs> suppose a government decides that uh, since they cannot figure out how to handle 44 million people uninsured and since they cannot figure out how to retain the cost of health care going many times a gross national product, at least the rate mm -hmm. going greater than, then, um, and, and so they decide to take a radical move. and. And then being somewhat un-American, they decide to actually look at best practices for a change elsewhere. That is um, not obeying the GE modem of not invented here, no good. So they, they look at the Japanese, and maybe they look at the Canadians, because Canadians are being progressive in this area. And they said, let's do something like um, telling every American that they have so many credits that they're to spend using uh, the the New York model or this mm -hmm. this uh, uh, model of 100, 150, 200. They give them so many credits. That's one kind of approach. I said there would be two questions. Suppose, on the other hand, they said uh, you're going to be at a different income tax bracket or you're going to be fined. Um, if you don't follow, if you, if you don't come up to the mark, 
I mean, all of these things are, have constitutional problems. The latter has more serious. But either one of those, I can think of a few more, but we shouldn't be doing that. Is, is there any move uh, to, in Congress or elsewhere to incorporate progressive ideas with respect to dealing with health care other, other than just shaking our heads? So, great question. What are the, what are the incentives, it's a carrot and what are the carrots and sticks that are likely to ev evolve here? And maybe I'm more optimistic. I don't see us, for mainly because of con uh, constitutional issues, moving too far down the major stick road. Uh, but the carrot road is, start is actually starting to look pretty interesting right now. We've got lots of examples with major employers that are actually, in many, many different ways, incenting employees to do things they might not otherwise do. Sometimes it's cash, sometimes it's credit type bonuses. A lot of it's wellness oriented, but not completely. Some of it's actually getting into clinical cases. The most controversial thing that's happening on the carrot side, but it's not that controversial and it's actually being reasonably well received, are employers that are basically saying to the employee, you know what, you need, you, we've got you insured and you need a new hip. So you can have it here in the United States at that hospital over here, which is probably going to give you an infection. You're probably not going to get great service. Or tell you what, we'll send you to Singapore, and here's 5,000 bucks. Your choice. I know some of them. <laughs> so I think. To an American trained doctor, but in a different. To an American trained doctor in a different country. In fact, we'll give you his, you know, his his Harvard or his Mayo Clinic credentials in a hospital that's much more run like a Four Seasons than. Than, than, the ones, than the ones in the U.S. It's called so, medical tourism. It's called medical tourism, but it's, I think it goes beyond tourism when somebody else is actually starting to you know, uh, write, write the check. And medical tourism is now, it's now I think, right on the verge of essentially being mainstream. A, the last uh, article I just read showed over a million cases out of the US, originating out of the U.S. But the employers are beginning to wake up on these big expensive cases, these cases that cost in excess of say 20 to to uh, eighty thousand dollars or so, somewhere in that time frame, that are not emergent, where they, they where you have time, where there's a, you, and, and a lot of joint surgery happens to fall in that category, and so I think you know I think that's another way around it. That's one of the ways that the, that's one of the tools, frankly, the payer has to break the economics of the current provider system, and. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, it's a practical one, and it's one, frankly, that there's, there's plenty of infrastructure to address. The real hurdle is, is how do you incent your employee to go to Singapore? And the answer is pretty simple. Give them part of the savings. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the presentation. It was insightful. The, uh, my question is really around the slide that you focused on for a while. I think it was called Wireless Health Market Developments. Mm -hmm. And it's really your paradigm for the way that this ecosystem is maturing. And mm -hmm you analogize that to uh, RIM in the environment when uh, a lot of the carriers weren't playing ball and they kind of had to do it themselves. So what I'm curious about is your reaction to, it, it strikes me as this is disruptive and I want to know your reaction, but um, with the iPhone plus Bluetooth rolling into the space, does that shake everything up the way you described it? So the question really is, are there developments like the iPhone that, that kind of are, are game changing here in the healthcare space? So from one hand, you can look at the iPhone and say, hey, listen, They've, they've mastered wireless glass. It's essentially a blank screen that you can figure out whatever the hell you want to put on that uh, blank screen, and it's connected. Um, and that has absolutely been game-changing to the handset uh, guys. Not so much because it was a blank screen, but because the user interface was so much better than, than uh, from people's perspective, maybe with an argument over the keyboard. But other than that, the... Um, so much of the rest of the user interface was dramatically a leap, uh, leap forward. Um, certainly not a leap forward in things like battery life and a few other things. But it's interesting how many of those poor features people have been willing to look past because the other, the other user interfaces were very good. The Bluetooth link is interesting, but Bluetooth, from my perspective, will not be successful in healthcare. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the battery life management of Bluetooth devices and on the phone itself is poor. Um, two is you, you have to, in my mind, if you don't design the user interface to manage that, meaning that the phone and or the device kind of automatically turn themselves off when not in use so you don't screw up the, the, uh, the power on, on either device quickly, you, you have a poor user interface because people are always unhappy because their devices are dead or, or dying faster than they would otherwise, uh, otherwise die. And then on top of that, you have pairing issues. So Bluetooth doesn't have common 
protocol here. Uh, frankly, th there was at one point, I think it's down from this now, but there's one point early on in Bluetooth when 40% of the devices were returned for failure to pair, meaning the consumer couldn't figure it out. Now, I, from my own personal experience, I believe a good portion of that was they really couldn't pair, and another portion of it was they, you, the consumer couldn't figure it out. But um, it's the pairing is an issue and the power management is an issue. So where's it going to go? Well, we've got low energy Bluetooth, you know, kind of well on its way. That solves some of the use cases, but not all. Um, there is, of our count, at least six radios moving rapidly towards commercialization or in-commercialization that can deal with low energy. There's more kind of on the drawing boards of universities, et cetera, that might address the Band-Aid space. The Band-Aid space is definitely one that needs low energy. Um, for, uh, for power management. But interestingly enough, some of the radio technologies we've seen are actually too efficient. If you're in the medical disposables business, you don't actually want to hear a story that says, I've got a radio that will make your Band-Aid last three weeks. You actually want to hear the story that says, I've got one optimized for three days. So, because um, you actually want to turn these disposables over. So, uh, and the other practical reality is Band-Aids actually slough off because of skin sloughing, so they're not going to last that long anyway. But um, uh, so, so it's an interesting mix. You don't actually have to have that ultimate, you know, radio that goes on and on and on forever, uh, but you do want something that goes better than what we've seen, kind of with with uh, with Bluetooth. But I think the 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 notion that you can kind of have a freedom of a blank sheet of paper that the iPhone represents, combined with body area networking and the concept that the consumer actually generally understands the concept of body area networks. They've never actually probably thought of it that way, but they've seen the Bluetooth headpieces, they own one, they maybe have a visor uh, a speaker phone. Um, you can go down to Costco today and buy either a Bluetooth set of bathroom scale and uh, blood pressure cuff and pedometer or a FitLinks radio. You have two choices, two personal area radio choices, and you can get them at Costco today. Um, FitLinks is the radio that Apple uses. So there's your iPhone <laughs> solution. So, um, you know, I, I, think, I think we're moving into that point. Obviously, Nintendo is, is kind of teaching people that body area networks and big screens and, and balance boards are all, you know, part of a fun entertainment, maybe fitness program. So I, I think um, if anybody's behind here, it's not the consumer electronics folks. It's, it's probably the healthcare professional folks. Um. <laughs> Any final questions? Okay, you're welcome to interact with Don for the next few minutes. Let's uh, thank him very much. Thank you very much.